Greetings, everybody. How are you doing today? This will be uh, my third episode of Inside Track, my Friday afternoon live stream tutorial. Basically, I'll pick a subject and do a one hour lesson on it. And feel free to leave any comments, any questions in the chat. I'm monitoring it. There might be some latency between when you ask and when I see it, but I will, um, I will look at it. If you're new here and you like this kind of content, please subscribe and ring that bell. Please give a thumbs up. It helps the channel. And today what I thought I would do would be to talk about MIDI orchestration in film scoring. And what I'll use as an example is my score to the uh, George Lucas biopic I scored for the Kennedy Center Honors in 2015. So this is about, uh, about a three-minute piece of music um, with a couple of breaks in the middle because the film had some music that was embedded in the clips they were showing, and I had to stop the music. But we'll go over what I did for this. And again, this is five years, six years old, but it still holds up. The sounds are still pretty good on this. And a couple of topics I want to talk about with this. The first one being to write for the to write for the sounds you have. Right. So if you have, if you're a student or a beginner or you don't have a lot of sample libraries. Know what you have and know what its strengths are and write music that takes advantage of those attributes. Also, learn how to program a little bit more. We're doing some stuff in my, one of my classes where we're using in Pro Tools Expand 2, which has over a 10-year-old piece of technology. And... Most people use the presets and they complain about how it sounds. And if all you used were the presets, yeah, a lot of them don't sound so great. But if you take some time, get under the hood, learn how to program things and tweak things a little bit. So, for example, no muted strings in the string orchestra. Well, what you can do is you can take the filter that's on the plugin and lower the cutoff frequency and that and save that as muted strings and it will suffice. So anything you can do to expand upon the sounds that you have will help. And also knowing what to write with your instruments. So in other words, if you don't have a good legato string patch, well then be careful what you write for that. You know, maybe you have a great legato flute patch, you would substitute something like that instead of maybe a solo violin that's legato, things like that. And a couple of other techniques I want to talk about is varying ensemble sizes. Uh, in this piece, I've got solo flute and three flutes, solo oboes, three oboes. I've got uh, wind sections, solo instruments. With the, with the brass, I've got a solo hump, trumpet, I've got three trumpets, I've got two horns, I've got a solo horn, I've got six horns, I've got brass sections, and right through the whole orchestra. Just varying the size of your ensembles can really help to mask the fact that you're writing for samples and make your orchestrations better. And to be honest, if you were writing for real players, you'd do the same thing. And the other thing is articulations. I watched a video recently where somebody was showing how to do an orchestral track in Pro Tools and then how to move it over to Sibelius. And they basically used really one articulation for every instrument. And they didn't do, uh, and, and it, it sounded mechanical and almost like an organ because the other thing they didn't do was they didn't animate the sounds. So a lot of sample libraries have dynamics programmed with the mod wheel. Use that. Use expression. Use MIDI volume. Um, so all these kinds of things help your orchestrations. So what I'd like to do now is 
I will switch over to my computer screen and we'll take a look at this track. Okay. Let me get a little beverage here. So, as you can see here, and let me zoom in so it's a little easier for you if you're watching on your laptop. I've got this set up with my winds on the top. And I've got some section winds, staccato, legato, I've got piccolo, I've got flute legato, I've got flute staccato, and I like to put them on empty tracks, uh, individual tracks, my articulations. I don't like doing key switches. It's hard for me to keep track of things that way. Um, everybody's got their own way of working. I've got three flutes, oboe, oboe staccato, three bassoons, then I've got low wind sections, staccato and long. And then I've got a solo trumpet, three trumpets, two horns, solo horn, six horns, and then those are all, I believe, legato sounds. And then I've got short in some ensemble sounds for the brass. Mid-brass long, mid-brass short. And I think that the solo winds are orchestral tools. Oh, let's go back out. No, the symphonic, uh, it's Spitfire symphonic winds. Let's see. Yeah, so I've got Albion, I've got Spitfire symphonic winds. I think some of these, though. Yeah, so here we go, orchestral tools. So I'm using orchestral tools, Spitfire audio. There's some cine samples in here. Those are my main um, sounds at this time when I was writing this. And then if I scroll down, let me zoom in again. I've got my drums, my timpanis. Snare, bass drum, cymbals. Yeah, the cymbals should actually be here. Then I've got my pitched percussion, right? Glock, tube, harp, xylophone, marimba, finger cymbal, uh, piano, and then I've got electric piano. And then I've got some like synthesized sounds with Omnisphere, and I rendered it as audio. And it's basically just a sort of a celeste sound, celeste bell sound. And then I've got some choirs. And then all my strings. And again, I've got several kinds of legato violins. And I've got high string staccato, spikier violins, lower string staccato, concertino, long strings, low strings, tremolo and pits, and then Bartok pits. And then below that, I've got just a, a hall and a delay. This isn't the mix that went on air. This is the, my working mix. I render everything as audio before I mix. And then, you know, I do a little bit more work with sending f reverb. I may, might have another delay that's a uh, reverb that's a different size. So rather than play the whole thing, I'm just going to uh, start going through it section by section. So I'll play a section and I'll talk about it. Uh, I will, after this, put a link in the description box for the actual film. I have it up on my YouTube site, so you can come back and watch that if you want. It's really, the filmmakers did a great job. So let's start talk about the beginning and you could see that on my timeline here i've got lots of memory locations or markers right so they that's basically my outline for this piece you know this gives me my structure where all the important things are and i know where to move the music towards so the opening takes place childhood right beginnings should be wondrous possibilities, innocence. So let's take a listen. And here we go. And this is best if you're listening with, this is best if you're listening with headphones or earbuds, by the way. Here we go. All right, and then the music stops here because they go into uh, Flash Gordon and The Shadow, which has music, which is his childhood uh, radio shows that he listened to. 
So let's open up the MIDI editor and we can take a look at what we're doing. So the beginning starts off with some concertino strings right here. And then right after that, there's piano, pizzicato strings. Well, we don't need to see this stuff right now. We can make this a little shorter, so we, smaller so we can see everything. And then I believe there is... There's another sound that's doubling the piano. I think it's that omnisphere. And then the trumpet comes in. So if we look at here, the piano is just doing a very s simple one. Right, da da di dum dum. And then there's just the bass going boom, bump. Bum, ba, boom, bum, bum. And let me just uh, scroll down here and let's just take a listen to this. Right, so that's the omnisphere sound. I've just soloed that, right? So it's doubling the piano. And it adds a sort of a dreaminess to the piano. And that's part of orchestration, is knowing how to double things to create a mood, a world. And the other thing, too, is, right, I wanted a really dark piano. And so I'm using this ivory piano, which is this German D, which is fairly rich and dynamic. But I went here and I put a low-pass filter on it. So... And this, this is automated because later on in the piece, I want the brighter piano. But if I were to bypass this, uh, I can't bypass it. <laughs> oh, what I can do is um, I can make this inactive. Right, so that's the piano without the high low pass. And there you go, muted. And that really blends in beautifully with Right, it creates this sort of ethereal, otherworldly, like ch like childhood imagination, dreaming, you know, all that stuff that you get as a child that where th your things are wondrous and you don't really know, you haven't really experienced life that much yet. Everything is new, so this goes on, and then there's also a little choir drenched in reverb, and there's just a little bit of these finger symbols. And if I played the pizzicato strings with that, you'd hear, you know that, boom, ching, right? So I do it every other measure, and it fits in between the pizzicato of, of the, child, the lower strings. So it sort of becomes part of the sound and part of that pizzicato uh, part, but it's a different color. So you're sort of, what you're doing is you're taking a part and you take one note and you remove it from that part and you assign it to another instrument. And you don't do that every measure, you do that every couple of measures so that it's not so predictable, right? And that creates a really nice, So these are all orchestration techniques, you know, doing that stuff with the um, with the high pass with the low pass filter to the piano, right? If I was going to record this and I wanted that sound, maybe the, you know, we we have two pianos in the room if this was a live orchestra, and one of them would have the lid closed and a couple of covers on it, and the other one would be fully open, right? So just or or maybe one would be an upright with the felt with felt on it. And then right there, we've got a little ascending trumpet figure. Bum, bum, beat up, ba, bum, ba, ba, bum. Let's see, where is that? That is right here. Right, and, and seriously, it's, 
it sort of relates back to the piano figure. So if we go back to a little bit and we just solo these two instruments. Right, it's sort of taking a little bit of the piano figure and stretching it out longer time-wise so that it takes up, instead of it being eighth notes, it's a quarter note, right? The longer notes, longer rhythm values. So I'm sort of layering those two things on top of each other and it makes a really nice juxtaposition. And then right here, So I had been doing the piano all along, and then in this section here, the piano figure changes. So let's get that piano up here. And then I add Glock and harp. Right, so the figure changes, it becomes that one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three. And that's sort of like a, a little bit of a variation on one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, one, two. Right, so here I've got boom, bum, bum, boom. Right, I've got, instead of it being one, two, three, three eighth notes, three eighth notes, and then a quarter note here, right, I've got this on the last eighth note. And then that sort of, the figure that it changes to here is a variation on that. And that, again, is orchestration, arrangement. And then only have a harmony note like leading in to the next bit. And then the... Right, you see how the bell is accenting that one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one. And then the next measure, right? So... A typical thing would be to have this figure with the light green. Boom, bum, 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 right? But I like to, it comes in once, one measure. And then it holds. And then it holds, right? And then a little bit more busy the second time. And that's over this harp figure. So let's listen to the whole track up to the, into that. So at this point here, the, the, the rhythm feels a little bit more floaty and So let's just solo the bass, the pizzicato bass, and you can see how that also works with this. So if I just take it one measure before. Right, and there you go. See how that changes? And then this is one phrase from seven to nine. <coughs> Excuse me. boop a deep boom and I don't repeat this figure exactly. The rhythm's the same, but the pitch contour is a little different. And it goes all the way up this time. And then the next time through, a pickup. And then there's also some work I do with strings there. So I've got consordino and then tremolo. And let's solo all those and we can listen to how that works. changing articulations. So that's kind of cool, right? So um, in other words, I've got Consordino, then Tremolo. And notice that the Consordino has very little vi vibrato on it. If I were to just play the keyboard. So let me just turn this up so you can hear it. So this is with no vibrato. I've got my controller here with vibrato here. And I can bring that in. 
So that's a choice I made to have it a little icier like that with, uh, with very little vibrato on the beginning here for the concertino strings. And then let's do this. Uh, let me just show you these chord voicings. Hopefully this won't crash Pro Tools. <laughs> That'd be really embarrassing. Come on, bud. Okay, here we go. Gee. All right, so you could see here that this is a D major seventh chord. If I were to line this up in thirds here, let me get it out of the, my way. There we go. So we've got A, D, F sharp, and C sharp. But what I did was I took the second, if it was in close position, I took the second note from the top and dropped it down an octave. And that's called uh, a drop two voicing. So this is uh, the same thing. This F sharp, if it was in close position, would be up here, and I just dropped it down an octave. And those kinds of voicings really uh, up, up there, they're just nice and atmospheric. So voicing chords, right? Knowing how to voice your chords, different ways of voicing chords, that's part of orchestration. And do I have something in the tenors here? All right, I've got these as audio. So that goes along with the violins. I must have rendered them for some reason. So if I go to concertino and tremolo, let's listen to that little figure with the choir. Right, so the, the tenors are an octave lower. You see what that adds? You know, when you layer things in like that, it's, so it stretches everything out. So instead of it being, even though those are open voicings in the violins, the tenors are not open voicings. They're more closed voicings, but the violins are up here and the tenors are down here. So you've stretched that chord out a couple of octaves. And the support that those tenors give, it's really nice because it's a different color than, say, using violas. And uh, the combination is really beautiful, I think. All right, and then let's go. There's uh, so I don't have these named properly. I would fail myself. <laughs> so we've got solo horn in the beginning here, solo trumpet in the beginning here. So let's listen to what we do here. Okay, so that's this section here. So if we look, we're starting off with the solo horn. Well, with solo trumpet. So let's get these up on our MIDI. Solo trumpet, and then um, we've got legato bassoon, legato flute, and then high winds, I think. Yeah, and that's just solo this whole bit. So we start off with this little trumpet melody here. And then I pass this little figure around. Solo horn, oboe, horn, oh, and then where is that flute? Oh, it's flute legato. So, right, so the flute is this note here. It just is playing this long note and sort of adding emphasis to that we've landed on that note and adding a color to that. You see how the, and the flute fades in, and then we've got this sort of descending figure. And I'm using this ensemble sound right here. Now, let me talk a little bit about ensemble sounds. I like to use ensemble sounds. Why? Because they're easier. I like to use them mixed with, as you see here, with individual instruments. So the ensemble sounds, 
they're captured with the players playing together in the room. And that will give you a much different sound than if you took the three instruments or four instruments that are playing those notes right there and played them into four tracks with four individual instruments. These people are playing in the room. They're blending together. You're getting the resonance of all those instruments in the room at the same time. And I, I, that's not something that you can that sounds as good when you program it. And um, so you get these broad strokes with those ensemble patches, and then you get detail with the solo with the solo patches or articulations. All right, so let's hear how this is put together with everything. Let's see. Here we go. So a little compositional thing. So I've got these pizzicato strings that are going up and they're doubled with the harp. And then there's, um, I think there's Yes, table violins. Let's un. Right, so you could see with this figure here, I've got stuff going up and stuff coming down. <laughs> so it looks like hairpins. Now, one thing here that I like is I talk about different ensemble sizes, right? So let's... So right here, this is... Uh, that's an uh, legato solo, a uh, small ensemble. Right, I, I think that's only a few players. Um, and then this up here. Ah, I have it the opposite. Okay, so this is the smaller section. And then this is the larger section. So you could see that those are different sounds. Oh, I should go back to my screen here. I do that in my class all the time. You guys should write something and let me know that I'm not on the screen. So, I, again, they sound totally different. And if you were orchestrating this, you would, you know, orchestrate it and say just the first, the first person on the st each stand. So you'd cut the size of your string section down quite a bit for certain things to be more delicate and more intimate. Okay, so at this point, we've got to stop because we've got the Flash Gordon and then the Shadow, and there's like archival footage from those two radio programs. And then he reads books, he's becoming an adolescent, he's getting interested in things, and the music becomes more optimistic, more energetic. And uh, let's take a listen to the next little bit. Let's get that that much. So we start off with a figure in the strings, and let's get our editor up. And let's see. So we've got high staccato strings. Right, and then lower staccato uh, strings. So we've got two different ensembles here, right? We've got upper strings and lower strings. And again, I'm using a spiccato articulation here. We're not using pizzicato in the low strings anymore. We're not using legato. So again, changing articulations, that'll really help out with your uh, MIDI orchestrations, right? Uh, wrong camera. Fire the... Uh, person changing the cameras. Okay, 
So let's continue on. And then I like this kind of a thing here compositionally, right? Most people would start, if I muted these, and most people would start this figure. Right, but this little pickup, if I unmute that, really adds a lot, I think. Boom, boom. Right, you're, you're really phrasing into the downbeat, and also the fact that you've got all this steady rhythm going in the upper strings. And then you've got some offbeat accents in the lower strings landing solidly on beat four here, and then giving us a little one beat rest for the transition to the next section where the music changes. Right, so originally I had these two notes here, so let me unmute those. And you can hear how much worse it is with those extra notes when you don't have the rest. Right? It's like horrible. I don't know what I was thinking. But fortunately, before it went on air, I muted those notes. <laughs> and again, the oboe figure here. So notice, I've gone from playing a figure in the high strings, and then I pass that over. Let's see, high staccato strings. I pass that over to the staccato oboe. So let's do let's take it from 24. Oh. Oh, solo would help. Okay, here we go. And then let's get back down to our strings. Yep. So if we take it from here, you can hear the strings are in. And then this is cool too with the oboe. Um, I have one note that's legato in there. Right, so you could see it's, uh, well, there's another note muted here, so let me just get rid of that. You could see that I want those notes to be longer, and I want my, right, that just to be a little bit longer. It adds a lot. So again, attention to detail. Now, this figure here, right, this is taken from that piano figure at the beginning, right? So you're pre preparing you for this as the piece goes on. And while this rhythmic thing is going on here, we've got these pizzicato strings that are doing, again, that ascending line like before, except we are doing rhythmic displacement. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is we've got the first time we're, we're missing the downbeat, and then we have the same figure well, a variation on the same figure, but it starts on the downbeat. So, in other words, this is an eighth note later. So, let's listen to what the, how that works. And then, notice how the second time through, it's a little different. I keep the rhythmic displacement, but I change the rhythm on the second time through. So, these just all these variations... This is partially composition, it's partially orchestration, because notice I'm throwing all these different articulations and different colors at you. And it's sort of like a kaleidoscope where, you know, it's just this never-ending unfolding of orchestral colors. And I think for film music, it really helps to, uh, and it, not all the time, because there are times where you want things to be ethereal and atmospheric and long you know, long unfolding and to change very slowly. But this is a very fast-paced, three-minute short documentary film. And this helps to drive that. And it's also really helpful if you've controlled to be able to do both styles. And then there's this high 
concertino strings. Let's just solo the strings and the pizzicato, and we'll get the strings in here. And notice how the strings sort of overlap. They don't, they don't go exactly one bar. And this one starts a little early. So again, just doing anything I can to sort of mess up where the downbeat is. Yeah. Okay, so let's unsolo. And then there's also a choir in there, I bet. No, no, oh yes, there is choir. Yeah, there is choir in there. So if we have the piano, let's say, and there's also a piano. And xylophone. So let's listen to that with, so this is all the same section. You see how complex this uh, orchestration is, right? Right, so you get this really beautiful, for me it's beautiful anyway, hopefully you guys like it too, this really nice aggregation of all these sounds put together. And then we've got a little... And then we've got a little transition to get back to the uh, original beginning of this session section. And it's a measure of 2-4 right here. And that's typically because there was a picture cut, right? And so I do a big uh, orchestration change here. So now the second time through with this bit, let me make my scrolling go with the page. All right. The second time through with this bit, if we look at the uh, pizzicato strings and the piano, could see how much more busy it is than the very be the very beginning of this you know where where that kind of figure came in earlier so again developing as the piece is going forward so now i pass the ostinato along to the harp right here, solo that, and, and notice that changes octaves. And listen to how that left hand, the sort of the figure in the harp locks in with the pizzicato. Here we go, three, four, boom. Right, there's a note here that's being covered by the harp note, right? Doom, doom, doom. So again, you can, if you, if you, there's all sorts of notes under here with the harp. You could see the blue ones. And so it's just this variation, keeping things moving forward, not doing the same thing over and over again, not repeating, and constantly developing. It's like a, a big cycle. And this is getting a little bit more serious here. He's driving cars, and it's leading to a, a bad car crash where he almost died, right? So things are getting serious here. And um, so we're right here. So we bring our high strings back in. That should be with... Yes. So, and then there is some other choir in here. Kind of cool. And then we've got uh, a few marimbas. So let's just listen to the harp, the marimba, and the short choir. And then, and this says piano, but that's actually the glock. Let's fix that. 
All right, and then the Glock gets layered. So you see how I'm just sort of, this is in, all interlocking? And notice that the Glock, which is right here, we can look at this here to see this. The Glock, which is right here, is not playing the same exact figure as the harp. Rest. That did do that did rest. That that did that did rest. And there's piano in there also. So the piano's doubling the top line of the harp. Right, and again, just changing the figure up here and then these really offbeat piano chords that come in right in this area here. And there's also a tube that comes in. And notice that's not on the downbeat. So I'm sort of trying to obscure and create this sort of circular rhythm going on where it's moving forward. Now, he's in a car crash here and he almost dies, but you don't want, for this kind of a thing, you don't want it to get too morbid. You just want it to be more sort of reflective, and that's that can be helped out with orchestration a lot. Okay, so then the next bit is a second chance, right? So let's see what happens here. Uh, let's take it from right here. That ascending string line. And again, you see how I've taken that ticket to ticket to ticket, which was in the piano at the very beginning of the piece, and I've sort of done this um, development of that further on. It's not, it's, it's not like development in the traditional classical sense, but it's almost like you're just transforming it and passing that idea around, changing the harmonic language of it, maybe the, the orchestration of it, and also the pitches obviously you're changing but you're keeping the general idea and it helps people to follow along it creates a sense of a character developing throughout a story and by passing it around to different instruments and you can really and orchestrating it like that you can really get a good se sense of that happening right so before i had a single horn and now i've got two horns And then to a unison line. So that comes in really nicely. And that, you know, again, doubling the pizzicato strings with these low winds. And then this little ascending figure, which was from the trumpet at the beginning, right here in the oboe. And again, you've got those offbeat ascending pizzicato strings in the lower part of the strings. Yeah, this actually should be here. So now he's in college at USC, and we've got the the Rhythmic vitality in the strings continues, even though the figure changes. Oh, so this should actually... <laughs> so we've got these high winds, staccatos. And let's listen to that with the high staccato strings. Right, and then I've got a couple of notes where the lowest strings are doing Bart's, Bartok pits, right? So again, just changing articulation. It just adds a lot of color and variety. So again, you could see how some of the things I talked about earlier about changing your articulations, really helps. Let's let's continue on to the next section. 
This is a, a transition to his first, uh, to becoming friends with Francis Ford Coppola and his first student film, right? And this is, again, I've got the, that incessant eighth note figure, but now I've got it in the lower strings, right? And there's a, just one Bartok hit. Mid brass, and then there's some low wind staccato here, and see how they blend together. And then there's some bassoons right over here. And do ba ba beep ba ba ba. That's uh, doubling this. So now if we add this back in. And then now we're talking about his movie uh, THX, his first movie. And um, it's this futuristic look of the world, and it's kind of dystopian in a lot of ways. And I wanted the music to be really intense here, and so I started bringing in some more juicy harmonies, and we'll go over those in a second, and fuller orchestrations. And now we're transitioning to his first big hit, which was American Graffiti. And there's no music in that section because there's At the Hop <laughs> and Wolfman Jack and all that stuff. So let's take a look at this. Let's take a look at what I've done here. All right. So you could see that I've got, let's see, if I do this. So I've got high staccato strings, right? And then I've doubled those with spikier violins. And they're playing this. Right, you can hear how nasty that sound is, and that's beautiful for this. If I have the two of them together, you can see how those really adds a nice edge. And notice how I've layered them in. That's both violin sections playing now. So, again, I didn't have the violin sound I wanted, so I created it by doing a little programming. I, I layered some spikier strings, which is a smaller section, on top of those spiccato strings, and I got the edge and bite that I wanted. And this is kind of cool here. I've got this really interesting wind figure. Got this really spiky chord here. E, B flat, and E flat, I believe. Yeah, so it's the upper partial of a sharp nine chord. Upper structure, I mean. And we've got, um, yeah, so let's look at the brass here. So these brass chords are really spiky, so let's solo those. And these are ensembles. All right, let's take a look at those chords that could be helpful. So I've got E flat and E natural, right? So I've got a ninth a minor ninth there, and then I've got A flat, B flat, and this must be an E flat. Yep. So I've got, let's see, if I were to, where's my piano sound? Here we go. If I were piano, so I've got, oh, I should solo that. Okay. 
right? So that's a really cool sound. So E flat, E natural, A flat, B flat, and B. So where did I get that chord? Well, the top four notes, E, A flat, B flat, or G sharp, A sharp, and D sharp, that would be like an F sharp 13 chord in jazz, or it would be a C7, a C7 with a sharp five and a sharp nine, right? So if I just take that upper structure and then double the uh, top note down two octaves, I get that really spiky chord. It's really, it's no in harmony can really help your realization of your music. So let's listen to all that in context. Then notice how this with this ascending scale that goes up, how as it's going up, I dovetail in some lower pitches halfway through. It's unisons, octave lower. And then the trumpets come in towards the end, right? The trumpets don't all play the whole thing. They just come in for the last few notes. And then we stop for American Graffiti, and then... So there's a few of you watching. If you've got any questions, pop them into the chat, and I'll, I'll answer them. I hope you're finding this interesting. Um, yeah. So we're getting towards the end. Oh, we've got another minute and almost two minutes of music left. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> okay, so the next bit is Star Wars, right? And Star Wars is iconic. It's not my favorite kind of music, uh, film, but it is an, you know, the, the whole thing is an, an amazing cultural phenomenon, and the score is so recognizable. So, what I wanted to do here was not to copy the score at all, but to invoke like something that John Williams might have possibly written, although I wrote it. So, let's take a listen to this next section and then we'll talk about it. Is there something soloed? Yes, there is. Okay, let's go again. So we're transitioning out of American Graffiti with these spacious, spacious ethereal strings. So, again, I wanted something to sound big in Hollywood, you know, not, you know, which you wouldn't typically do in a documentary. So, which is what this is, a biopic, a biopic or a biopic, however you want to pronounce the word. So, it starts off with these triplet figures in the winds. Right? So, this is this wind, and man, I, I changed tubular bell sounds on my new computer, and I'm not really, I got to fix that in, in the future. I don't really like the sound of that. Let me turn that down a little bit. Let's see. Let me do it this way. Okay. So I'm going to solo these winds here, even though they come in by themselves. Now notice when that boop up up da da comes in, I add that little figure with three flutes, right? So that's sort of like, you know, again, orchestration. As things are unfolding, you're, you're sort of... 
and I'm leading into the downbeat, right? And then... Um, Right, the strings are doubled by the, the winds are doubled by the spikier violins. These all have to be, uh, geez, I don't have these names properly. I would have failed myself. Okay. <laughs> so you could see how the, and this repeats. And it, it, the, the figure changes and I have a measure of three, four. But let me just show you uh, what I do with the strings here. So when the strings first come in, it's those spikier violins. And then the, then the second time through, let's see, let's get that up and make that a little bigger. Yeah, the second time through, you could see that I've doubled it with these, just the regular staccato strings. And again, changing section sizes, creating different articulations. And then right here, this is kind of cool. Let me, um, let's make this a little bit bigger. And let's zoom in. So you could see once I get to this section, right? Right here, you notice that this is the same place where the flutes are doubling Well, the next time through, and they'll double, they'll double it again, right? So the first time through, it's just those three flutes are doing the harmonies. Now this next time through, it's those spikier strings. And what's nice about that is the spikier strings is a smaller section so that when I play these close position chords, they still maintain that punch. If I were to do that with the regular string section, I'd lose some of the articulation because it would too much doubling. So that's one thing you have to worry about when you're using sections, right? Is that you're not making uh, very close position chords that have many notes. And now we also have all sorts of percussion work. So let's just, uh, let's solo our percussion in this section here. And we're coming up into this next bit. Symphony roll, big. <coughs> Excuse me, you get that big march feel there. And it's just for a few bars, and then it comes out. But as far as articulations go, again, what I wanted to talk about was... So on this one, I actually am using string uh, key switching, which I'm not a big fan of. But let's say that I move this up here, and I just uh, muted the six horns, and this was played on solo horn. Yeah, it doesn't quite do it, right? The six horns. And then for the last, so again, that's why you change your ensemble sizes. And then here at this point, um, on this last bit here, instead of making a chord with, well, this is a dyad here, it's two notes, and I make it in, these are key switches, the bottom in notes there, but this long note, that's a harmony note to this note, and I have it in the two horn section. Let me just uh, clean that up, right? So instead of it being two notes in the six horn section, which would sound like 12 players, I've got 
six players on this top note and then two players on the bottom note so that doubling doesn't become so obvious. And these big, rich, low chords here for accents, those are, are done in sections, in low brass sections. All right, so I want to just get through the rest of this. Um, we're getting to be an hour, and I've you only wanted this to be an hour, but this is really a very long, a long bit, longer than I thought it would be. So now we're talking about him not directing anymore and after first Star Wars and becoming a single parent, right? So again, I go back to the sort of innocent music. layering all those instruments in because now we're going to move to talking about Lucas uh, the technical stuff that he did and Skywalker Ranch I forget what the name of his company is called uh, but where he's got that in the Marin County he's got that big ranch where they do all sorts of special effects and you know stuff that's groundbreaking and has changed the way that movies look and I wanted some and then also that he's a big uh, charity gives tons of money to charity. So I wanted something that was, and we're getting towards the end, and since this was going to be playing at the uh, actual Kennedy Center event, which was attended by people before it was broadcast on CBS, I wanted the people to feel and to get up and be able to cheer at the end of this thing, right? So you got to sort of think about that stuff as you're writing. So we have this sort of just an, a kind of uplifting positive music that's sort of ascending through this whole bit, right? Got a little bit more insistent rhythm. And then on the repeat of that melody, I just broaden out the orchestration. There's bells the second time through, uh, an octave higher trumpet playing along with the horns. And it's just building. And that ascending chord progression in the bass. And then, you know, we're getting here where it's getting to the end and you want it to be emotional and feeling. And so I've got this sort of dream, this sort of floating section with, again, with the ostinato coming back in. And then... Dee da da dum, that trumpet figure that comes back all the way from. That bit there at the very beginning of the film. And these things matter. Bringing all these little characters back in and transforming them a little bit gives a sense of continuity. People remember that stuff, it helps the emotional unfolding. And I've got those offbeat pizzicatos. And then the peaceful ending. And that's just, that last chord is just spread out through all the, uh, all the ensembles. All right, so except for a couple little technical things where I forgot to switch uh, the view to the screen. I was talking for a few minutes and you weren't seeing the, the Pro Tools screen. I thought that that went fairly well. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, if you like this, please hit the like button. If you enjoyed this content, please subscribe and also ring that bell so you'll be notified whenever I come up with a new video. And it's Friday, March 19th. Tomorrow night is March 20th, Saturday night. I'll be doing a live stream uh, keyboard performance as I do most Saturday nights. Maybe some of you can see that, or if it's after the fact, maybe you can watch that. Anyway, thanks so much for watching. Leave any comments or questions below. I'll put a link for the film with the score in the description box below. I've been Pete Calandra, and I'll be back next Friday with another Inside Track. Great. I'm glad you enjoyed that Ojan or Kian Shen. Thank you for watching.
Yeah, Pro Tools. It's I work in Pro Tools. You know, it's not as full featured with MIDI as other DAWs, but you know, this is an incredibly complex piece of orchestral music, and it works. It works. And the upside of it is that when it gets mixed, I can hand in a Pro Tools session. I have to render it, you know, import it into Pro Tools. It's I can just create a Pro Tools session from this with stems very easily. All right, everyone. Have a great day, and I'll catch you next week.